Well, good morning. <laughs> Sorry, guys, the JV team's here today. Well, actually, it's JV, JV team. But uh, um, Pastor Glenn has a uh, sore throat, non-throat, non-speaking throat, I guess. And uh, so he called me yesterday. So just keep in mind, you're getting less than 24 hours work here, all right? I really don't know how he does this week in and week out. We'll find out, I guess, because, man, when I was done with first service, it was like, hey, it's time to go home and take a nap. Guess what? I don't get to go home and take a nap. So, <laughs> well, uh, this morning when I woke up, I was coming up with all kinds of uh, excuses. I was trying to figure out how I could be sick today and uh, stick this on Jeff, but, uh, but uh, that uh, there was a... Christian comedian years and years ago that did a bit about Moses and his call, and uh, and he said uh, he said it was funny how Moses Moses was called because he was talking to a burning bush, and uh, and I was thinking about that and, and God laid it in my in my mind right off the bat no excuses, and uh, so I said all right all right I'll do it I don't want to but I'll do it. Because I'm always scared when I get up here, I'm going to mess up and, and really embarrass myself and, and not do justice to what God would have me to do. And so I, I said, okay, no excuses. And then that Christian comedian's bit popped into my head. And, and uh, he said, uh, he said um, the name of the bit was uh, a butane bush, a wimpy prophet, and no excuses. And uh, I love that because uh, when you read about how Moses was talking to the burning bush, he, he, says, uh, he says, what kind of bush burns but doesn't burn? Must be a butane bush. Anyway, you can look it up on YouTube. It's funnier when he does it. <laughs> it doesn't have to be this way is the title of my message. It doesn't have to be this way. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I just come before you now and I praise you and I thank you for sweaty palms and butterflies in my stomach because that means I'm leaning on you and I'm counting on you, Lord. I'm counting on you to speak your words today. Dump me out, pour yourself in and speak through me. And I pray all these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. The last two years have been a whirlwind. Many things have happened, both good and bad. I lost friends and have had a few others express a lack of hope. What do you say to these people? Why would people who have everything going for them, good jobs, good health, people who love them, feel despair? I don't know for sure because I'm not God and I'm not a counselor. And I'm not anything but a man. That's all I am. So um, if something I say today affects you adversely, I apologize. I am not, uh, I'm not up here to upset anybody. Um, I guess what I'm trying to say is, is through my experience, I found out in my lifetime that uh, um, these things that I'm going to talk about today are true. And I hope that they'll be true in your life too. But in talking to each one of these people, a common thing I noticed was a lack of direction or a lack of goals for the future. Several scriptures point us toward a more hopeful life. Proverbs 28, 19, or 29, 18, I'm sorry. Where there is no revelation, people cast off restraint. But blessed is the one who heeds wisdom's instruction. There has to be a beginning. God's law gives us a moral compass It starts us, and if we let it, keeps us on the right path, the path that God has set for us. Each one of us, God, when he was knitting us together in, his, in our mother's womb, each one of us had a path, and he marked that path, and he tries to get us to stay on that path, but we're humans, and uh, I don't know about you guys, but there's a lot of bright sparklies beside the road, and and I can be pulled off the path really easy. And uh, um, I guess what I'm going to get to here is um, David from shepherd to king. David from shepherd to king. David, when he started out, he was, 
don't remember if he was the youngest. I'm, I'm, I'm shooting from the hip. And uh, um, I don't remember if he was the youngest, but I know he had a lot of older brothers. He was, wasn't he, Jeff? Thank you. God bless you, brother. Glad you're here. If, uh, if I say something really wrong, stand up and say, heretic, all right, will you? All right. <laughs> uh, David had a lot of older brothers, and I'm quite sure that, that uh, being the youngest and me being the youngest, uh, my brothers had a heyday with me. Yeah, I was, hey, throw Greg around. Don't have a ball? Throw Greg. Uh, don't have a ball? Get a bat. Throw Greg. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, I'm sure that he got battered around a little bit and, and uh, roughed up and all that, but it never deterred him. His experiences, um, his experiences made him who he was. When he faced Goliath, he didn't go out there. Well, it's 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 pretty cool. The whole story of David and Goliath is. We'll get off on a little rabbit tail here, and I'll get right back, I promise. But I love David and Goliath because the whole nation of Israel is terrified of this guy. They trembled when he came out and challenged them in the morning. And David shows up, and he's bringing cheese and, and other stuff for his brothers because they're in the army. They got conscripted, and he had to stay at home and watch the sheep. And uh, so his dad sends him to this cheese and, uh, and his brothers are in the trenches, and, and they're, they're trembling in fear as, as Goliath comes out. And David goes, who is this Philistine? Who does he think he is to talk about the nation of Israel like this? Doesn't he know we serve the one true God? He goes from getting beat up by his brothers to standing up in the face of Goliath. And finally, King Saul, King Saul, who's head and shoulders above everyone else. Read it. It's in there. Head and shoulders above everyone else. He should go out and face Goliath, but he doesn't because he's scared too. Why? Why are they all afraid? Because they're leaning on their own understanding. And David's not. David's a scrapper. And you know why he's a scrapper? Because he knows that God's on his team. And if he's on my team, no one can stand against me. And so when, uh, when he goes to Saul and says, I'll fight this guy. Who is he? God will go before me and destroy him. And Saul goes, whoo, got a sucker. And he lines him up and he gets him all lined up in his armor. And, and David goes, I, I can't wear this. I can't even walk in this. It's huge. So he goes, well, here, take my sword. He says, I can't even wield this thing. No, I'll just go my way. He goes out, whoosh, 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 boom, lays him out, right? Then he goes up and he takes the Philistine sword and he shows everyone he knows how to get ahead. <laughs> Come on, that was funnier than that. C Kimmel, at least, teeth there. There you go, all right. <laughs> oh... David did so many things, but he knew where his strength came from. He didn't, he didn't go out and face the bear and the lion by himself. He prayed before he went. He said, okay, God, you know what? I don't want to go. I'm scared to go, but I'm going to go, and I need you with me. And God honored that. Without the law, people cast off restraint. There has to be boundaries or people just run wild. A football analogy. Okay, um, they have boundaries, they have out of bounds. Why? Because if they didn't, people would run up in the stands to get away from getting tackled, right? It would be chaos. There has to be boundaries. There has to be boundaries in our life. And what are the boundaries in our lives? Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20, you can turn there if you want. It's just the Ten Commandments. Okay, just the Ten Commandments. Listen to me up here. Good grief. It's the Ten Commandments. And every law, almost every law, I don't believe every law we have today is based on those Ten Commandments. But nearly every law we have today is based in those Ten Commandments. Those are our boundaries. And God knows how simple we are, so he says, you know what, I'll just give you ten. I'm not going to give you a thousand. I'm not going to give you ten thousand like we got now. Just ten. Follow these. Those are the boundaries. 
It's simple. But then the second point is we have willful ignorance. Hosea chapter 4, verse 6. My people are destroyed from lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I also reject you as my priests. Because you have ignored the law of your God, I will also ignore your children. Without the law, people cast off restraint. Oh, jeez, man, I'm sorry, guys. It's we have to have a desire to know our purpose. We can't just do whatever pleases us and expect to find fulfillment. That path always leads to destruction. I'll say that again. We can't just do whatever pleases us and expect to find fulfillment. That path always leads to destruction. In this case, selfishness not only leads us away from God, but our children also. And when God ignores our children, they become lovers of themselves. 2 Timothy 3, verses 2 through 5. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godly godliness but denying its power, have nothing to do with such people. Okay, in the last verse, it said, in the very last verse of the, of the previous um, Hosea chapter 4, verse 6, it said, he will ignore our children. And there's very few things in life that terrify me. I'm, I'm, I'm not afraid of getting a beaten. I've had several, okay? I'm not afraid of, I'm not afraid of dying. There's days when I long for it. I'm not afraid of much of anything, but I am terrified that God will ignore my children. As a man, that should be the only thing that scares the bejeebers out of you. When Brandon was born, when, Bra when Lisa was pregnant with Brandon, and, and she knows this, so you don't, you're not sharing any secrets if you run and tell her. I was not excited about ha being a dad. I didn't want to be a dad. I just wanted it to just be me and her, and that's it. Me and her against the world. And she wanted kids, and, and so she's a lot better looking than me, a lot smarter than me, a lot more influential than me, and a lot prettier than me. And so I said, okay, we can have kids. And, but the whole time she was pregnant, I was like, Ugh, what am I going to do with a kid? Uh, kids are for other people. They're nice to admire from a distance. And it was funny because um, she, had, she had some complications and she had to go in for, uh, she had to go in in her last month and be in the hospital as she was abrupt a placenta. And uh, so she went in and... Uh, um, they, they got her stabilized, and, and the nurse sent me home said, go home and pack a bag, eat a lunch, and come on back, and, uh, and we're going to see where we go from here. And so I went home and packed a bag for Lisa and, and uh, was just going down to make a sandwich. And, uh, and the phone rings, and it says, get back here now. I'm like, get back here now. Why? And they said, just get here. I had that little Nissan Sentra wrapped up going through Boise. It's amazing I didn't get pulled over. And uh, um, when, I, when I went streaking past the nurse's station headed for the room Lisa was in, the nurse said, you're too late. And my heart sank. And I went, oh, no. I can face life with her. I don't know if I can face life without her. And I, and I stopped, and, and I was very short with the nurse. And, and I said, what do you mean I'm too late? And she, oh, bad choice of words. And, uh, and she said, we had to take her in for surgery, and uh, so you'll have to wait in recovery. 
And the whole time I'm thinking, and, 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 I, and I said yes to this. I, why didn't I stand my ground? They brought Brandon out, and they put him in my arms, and it was just like a flip of the switch. I went from not wanting kids to can't imagine loving anybody more. Just like that. See, girls, that's how weird guys are. Okay? We are strange creatures. I said all that to say this, that I love my boys. And all I ever wanted to do in life was to steer them towards Christ. Because I, I've told them since they were old enough to understand hello, that your only job in life is to be a better man than me, and I set the bar low. That's what I told them. And, uh, and so, and so they, they, praise the Lord, have cabbaged onto that, and they were better men than me at 12 years old. And, and, and I love that. And, and so that's, that's the thing that, that should terrify us as men is that, that we live a life that doesn't lead our kids to God, and God ignores them. That should absolutely make your heart sink with fear. Don't become lovers of ourselves. Third, repent. I love this definition of repent. I had a pastor that taught me this years ago. He said, when you come to a point in your life where your sin has gotten to the where you don't want it anymore, you take a stake and you drive it into the ground and you say, no more. I will not pass this point. And you turn around and you start walking back towards God. For me, sin is a bright sparkly. There's, there's everything in the world looks fun. It looks wonderful. But it's, some of that stuff is sin and it's not good stuff. And if we repent and we turn back towards God, Deuteronomy 4, 29 through 31. I love this. But if from there you seek the Lord your God, you will find him if you seek him with all your heart and with all your soul. When you are in distress and all these things have happened to you, then in later days you will return to the Lord your God and obey him. For the Lord your God is a merciful God. He will not abandon or destroy you or forget the covenant with your ancestors, which he confirmed to them by oath. Here God reaffirms his compassion towards victims of painful circumstances. He proves his compassion by promising to come through for his people even when they have failed him. He proves his compassion by promising to come through for his people even when they have failed him. I have, in my lifetime, and I'm not proud of it, but I have literally looked God in the eye, not literally, figuratively, looked him in the eye and said, no, I will not do that. And he still loves me. Now, there's a downside to that. You can do that, and he'll still love you. And he'll still have compassion on you. But all you have to do is talk to Jonah to find out how this works out. All right? Jonah said, mm, Nineveh, Tarshish, Nineveh, Tarshish, Nineveh, Tarshish. Yeah, Tarshish sounds good. Other side of the world. He spends three days in the belly of a whale. Can you imagine when that whale pulled up uh, on the shores of Nineveh? Well, it's a river, but he pulls up on the shore, and he pukes up Jonah, because that's exactly how it's put in the Bible. Pukes him up, vomits him out. He's all bleached white from the digestive juices inside this whale. And he comes walking up. And Jeff's a Ninevite fisherman. Act like you're fishing. There you go. And he comes up and he says, repent. What are you going to do? I know what I would do. I'm going to repent. 
The deal is, is that you're going to do what God wants you to do, whether you want to or not. It just determines your comfort level. Do you want to ride around the belly of a fish? Or do you want to just go do what he tells you to do? Jonah had good reason to not go, and if you ever read the history of Nineveh, you'll know why he didn't want to go. But he went anyway. He asks only that his people listen to him and follow his instructions for holy living. For holy living. Our relationship with God is certain because it is based on God's compassion for us, even when we don't necessarily deserve it. There's a lot of days that, uh, that, that we wake up and we, and we think, I don't deserve what I've got. And sometimes we feel like that in a positive way and sometimes we feel like that in a negative way. Um, I feel like that a lot in the positive way now. I don't deserve my wife. I don't deserve my kids. I don't deserve my business. I don't deserve my friends. I feel like that. And that's a positive way because it's humbling. It reminds me that God has blessed me greatly. And then there's times when we wake up in the morning and we say, I don't deserve to be treated like this, and I don't deserve to be treated like that, and I don't deserve this, and I don't deserve that. And sometimes we do. Sometimes, sometimes we deserve it. But even in the negatives, God has compassion on us. So change, change how you look at things. There are things in my life that I think, oh, gosh, I wish that was different. I wish that was better. Oh, ugh, I don't like that. Change it. Change how you look at it. I've had, I've had, uh, I've had people call me and say, um, I've got cancer. And what do you say to that? Sorry, um, I'll pray for you. Um, what do you say? And I don't, I don't pretend to have the answers, and I don't, I don't pretend to give you the answers, but here's, here's how I've responded lately. God is going to do something great in this. Phil kind of hit on it as he was leaving. He said, uh, he said our challenges and our, and our trials... Make us who we are. And if you're going through something tough right now, I can promise you that God is not doing it to punish you. He's not doing it to hurt you. He's not doing it for any other reason than so you can show other people His glory. I guarantee that. The God I know takes darn good care of us in everything. So finally, to wrap this up, because I don't want to keep you guys any longer than, than I have to, move forward. Move forward. Whatever, whatever was in the past is in the past. Move forward. Whatever caused you to lose your focus, define it, learn from it, and put it behind you. Don't live in the past. All right? Whether it's a failure or a success, don't live there. Move forward. My sons have come to me, you know, they've done things that, that they weren't proud of, and they'll, they'll say, oh, gosh, how do I, how do I deal with this? And, and it's years ago. Move forward. What did you learn from it? Move forward. Don't do it again. Don't stay there. Because if you stay there, you can't go forward. You can't do anything but live in that. Don't live in that. That's not what God wants for you. Seek the path God has laid out for you. That is where true blessing is. David was called a man after God's own heart because he sought after God and understood that was who gave him life and victory. David always repented and then moved forward. 
When you guys wake up in the morning and you look in the mirror, all right, I want you to stop looking at what you're looking at, okay? Because when I, when I, <laughs> I got to walk around. I can't stand still. This drives me crazy. I'm sorry about the camera. If I'm on the camera, I'm sorry. <sighs> when I, w- there was one morning I woke up and I literally, I looked in the mirror because normally you just comb your hair, brush your teeth, do your thing and, and get out of there because Lisa's waiting to get in. And, and uh, uh, I looked in the mirror and I went, where did that old man come from? I didn't even recognize myself. I was like, oh, geez, when did I get old? And I did. But don't, don't do that anymore. I want you from now on, I want you to, when you wake up in the morning, I want you to look in the mirror and I want you to see yourself through God's eyes. Listen to me, okay? See yourself through God's eyes. Because he knit you together in your mother's womb, and he knit you together for a reason. And it's probably, it's probably not what you think, all right? But he puts you there for a reason. Start looking at yourself through his eyes. Don't worry about what other people think. Don't worry about what you think. Think about what he thinks. I wish I had something more profound to tell you guys. I don't. I don't have anything more profound. I, I'm, I've uh, used up a bunch of your time, and, and I hope that uh, some of this made sense. I hope it wasn't all just the meanderings of an old man. Um, but he's got something in mind for each one of you. It's not a mystery. If you, if you stop and ask him what you want, what he wants you to do, He'll tell you. And there'll be days when when you wake up and you say, what do you want me to do? And he says, and you go, "Mm, Tarshish sounds better. All right? You can go to Tarshish, but my recommendation is is just go do what he asks you to do. Because he'll go before you, just like he did with David and Goliath. He went before David. Goliath was already dead and just didn't know it. Okay? So whatever he's thrown at you, charge headlong. Okay? I appreciate each and every one of you. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then you guys can go home and watch the Patriots whip them lambs. (laughs) Father, we just come before you now, and we praise you and thank you for today. I thank you for... um, I thank you for giving me no excuses this morning and uh, uh, kicking me in and getting me out of bed and and, uh, getting me to come down here. Lord, I love you. I I don't know why you picked me. I have no idea, but I sure am glad you did. And I just pray that uh, as the days and weeks go on, that each one of us uh, wrestles with this and and comes comes to the conclusion that you're a good God. And you love us and you want the best for us. And so, Lord, I just pray for that. Pray that you go before us now, make our paths straight, make our directives clear. We just pray all this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. And you are dismissed. <laughs>